are you? We are Venom. Those were up, and they did. We're smart, and my. Hey everyone, it's Don G. Corleone here, and I am here with a brand new movie review, back to the Spider-Man review series. And this review is going to be for not another Spider-Man film, but um, it's actually going to be for the first spin-off of this whole universe. And it was for the first installment of a separate universe called the Zoniverse, all based off the Spider-Man villains. And this was going to be part of the Mark Webb verse, but it got cancelled, but it got revived as its own separate thing. And, um, it was a certain character from Spider-Man 3, and a certain anti-hero. And that film was going to be for none other than 2018's Venom, directed by Ruben Fleischer. And Martin, why are you recording, putting this in the series? It's not a Spider-Man movie. Yeah, but it's based off a Spider-Man character. And I reviewed the Let There Be Carnage in 2021, so I might as well include the first Venom movie, so you guys know my thoughts on it. And, um, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't make any videos Monday or yesterday. I filmed the Little Mermaid review Sunday, but, yeah, there's just some things I don't want to talk about going on. Yeah, because just some annoying things I don't want to talk about. Some some false things that are not true. But anyway, enough about that. Let's get on with the review. What's the plot is? Well, after a faulty interview with the Life Foundation ruins his career, former reporter Eddie Brock's life is in pieces. And six months later, he comes across the Life Foundation again, and he comes into contact with the alien symbiote and becomes Venom, a parasitic anti-hero. So how is this film made? Well, by 1997, David Square wrote a script for a film featuring the Marvel Comics character Venom, which was to be produced by New Line Cinema. Dolph Lundgren is in talks to star in the film, which would feature the character of Carnage as the main antagonist. And the project did not move forward, sadly, and the rights of the character moved to Zony Pictures, along with those for the character Spider-Man, of whom Venom is an antagonist in the comics. Eddie Brock, the alter ego of Venom, would appear in Zony Spider-Man 3 with Topher Grace in the role. And Grace's intent to only briefly appear as Brock, but he became a major villain as both Brock and Venom because producer of Yara felt the series relied too much on director Raimi's favorite villains and not characters that modern fans were interested in. And Raimi was hesitant to explore the character because of his lack of humanity and revealed plans for a spin-off film focused on Venom in July 2007. And Zony was actively developing Venom alongside direct sequels to Spider-Man 3 by July 2008. Hoping the character could and long the to the franchise in a similar fashion to Wolverine 20th Century Fox's X Men films. Jacob S. had written a script for the film, but the studio chose to seek out new writers for a different approach from that draft. Sony was not yet convinced that Grace would serve as the lead actor in the film, and that September, Sony hired Paul Wernick and Rhett Reese to write a new script. One industry insider suggested that Grace should return for the spinoff because the likable actor could be a sympathetic evil doer. In response to Venom co creator Tom McFarlane suggesting that a Venom film could not. Could not do well with the villain and his central character. Wernicke and Reese had pitched the original story for the film to Zony, which Reese described as a realistic, grounded, a little more dark take on the character. The pair of them worked with an outline for Zony and Marvel, who had specific routes about the villain and the backstory and stuff like that. And they had completed a draft by April 2009, which included a role written specifically for Stan Lee. It featured a sequence where the Venom symbiote jumps from body to body through a city, and each person that it inhabits ends up becoming really violent and striking someone else, and then it jumps to them. And apparently, when developing Venom, Eddie was a journalist who got in trouble for it, and the whole essence for 
The Marvel characters must stay close to story, stay close to emotional story. The rest will be fun. For producer Matt Tolmek, best said, and when it could reset and turn in a second draft by September 2009, and Reese said that Sony was pushing forward in whatever they, ways they pushed forward. And a month later, Gary Ross, who has rewritten the script for Spider-Man 4 at the time before it got canceled, was heard to also rewrite the Venom script as well as direct and produce alongside the rut. And Grace was not considered likely to return for the role then, which, in which the film started for the drawing board and looking to make the villain an anti-hero became a defender of the innocent. And in January 2010, Sony announced that Spider-Man franchise would be rebooted because Raimi decided to no longer pursue the dark sequels of Spider-Man 3. But March 2012, Sony was still interested in the Venom film and wanted to use it to capitalize the release of the first reboot film, The Amazing Spider-Man. The studio was in negotiation with Doss Trank, the director of Ross, led the project to direct The Hunger Games. Trank was bought on following the release of Chrono Gullis' directional debut. He and big fan director Robert Siegel pitched an R-rated Venom film in the vein of The Mask. But Matt Tomek disliked their treatment. And, and then Arad and Tomek discussed Venom connecting to The Amazing Spider-Man. Films crossing over in the Avengers. Eric called in an egg Brock story, but Tomlock added that all these worlds would live together in peace someday. That never happened, and we all know Josh Shrink went on directed Fan 4 stick and it sucked. In December 2013, Sony plans to use Amazing Spider-Man 2 to establish their own expanded universe based on the Marvel properties that still had the film rights to, including Venom. Rod and Tomac would produce the film as part of a franchise brain trust with Alex Kutzman, Robert Orkey, and Ed Sullivan set to write the screenplay for Venom and Kutzman set to direct. In April 2014, Rod and Tomac said Venom would be released after Amazing Spider-Man 3, which originally was going to happen, but it didn't. But then Amazing Spider-Man 2 ended performed, and Sony shut those plans down. If originally, they were going to push Amazing Spider-Man 3 to 2018, but they did not, chose not to. And so, the Venom movie still ended up happening, but they decided it was going to be its own separate thing and do a separate universe called the Zoniverse. And Venom was the first one to start it off. So after the film was shot and marketed, Venom premiered at Regency Village Theater on October 1st, 2018, and theatrical release in the United States on October 5th, 2018, a few days later. The film was negatively received by critics and audiences for reactions, oh boy. But that didn't stop the film from making a huge profit because it became the seventh highest grossing film of 2018 with over $856 million worldwide and it set several records for an October release. And it got a sequel, released in 2021, and a third film is going to happen in 2025. Now, as for my reaction, okay. I know this movie appears to be hated by people, however, I'm going to say this. Some of you were expecting me to rant, destroy this thing to pieces, just rage at it. Prepare to be disappointed for those results, because I am not one of the people who hates this movie at all. Is it one of the best Marvel movies ever? Heck no! But I think it's mindlessly enjoyable and still better than Topher Grace's Venom. This is definitely a much... I'll take this Venom over Topher Grace. Because they at least get some of the more characteristics and voice right. This movie is about the symbiotic relationship of man and alien. And the latter being the gross one, funny at times, with a lovely performance from Tom Hardy. Like, if you're a fan of Hardy, this is going to be entertaining for you. Like, first half goes pretty well in terms of setting the story in the Venom universe. Second part's about more about action. The other has a few flaws, but it's still fun and interesting to watch. It's a cool view in an almost anti-hero Venom and Eddie character that kept my attention. My honest opinions were that the film is exactly what it needed to be. Thank God they don't pull an amazing Spider-Man 2 and try to set up a wider universe. There is space too, but I feel this film can stay as a stand- can also stand as a standalone movie. And the opening to the point of Eddie's first contact to me was definitely kind of poor in the acting department. And the story seemed very messy here, but as soon as the scene got hits, it's full steam ahead. A big point of content was the jokes. Yes, the turn of the wind line's a bit cringy. It's supposed to be bird in the wind, but it kind of sounds like turn in the wind for some weird reason. But I think a huge amount of the jokes do hit home. And for people who have seen a film, a certain joke regarding an elevator that was short and sweet and had me generally laughing, like it's when Venom tells Eddie to jump, but Eddie chooses not to. So he picks the elevator, and Venom's like, PUSSY! And now time to talk about Venom himself. CGI on him is now, I wanted Venom to look at a live-action version. 
It's slimy, toothy, grinning look that looks like something straight from the comics. Not the Topher Grace Venom that looks all scrawny and skinny, just looks like its own little Spider-Man suit. And it doesn't even say we, it only says I, me, which is not what Venom is supposed to say. Venom occupies its own universe. It's dark, gritty, a little more grown up compared to its counterparts, despite the PG-13 rating, which I'll get to later. The existence of Eddie's personal life does feel real. His struggles are far more relatable than any other character portrayed in a comic movie. During that era, he's an everyday guy who just screws up, and, and because of that, his need to redeem himself gets him attached to a symbiote. And now he's just trying to stay alive till the very end, when the truth of his circumstances means he's the only one who can prevent humanity's destruction. And the movie doesn't doesn't really lead up to this. If it, it wasn't ever known what was to come until the last 20 minutes of the movie. This is like a marriage of two separate movies, and it's done very well. You remove Venom, and the movie feels like it could stand on its own with a few key changes. The Venom portion hits all the notes required for a superhero movie. And I like the backstory of the film, and I really like how the film was shot in San Francisco. And it's a nice change from New York City for once. The build-up and conflicts of the relationships of the characters were good, and both the guy Eddie and Venom, and also Eddie and his supposed love interest Anne, played by Michelle Williams. There's a good amount of humor between Eddie and Venom, and Tom Hardy plays Eddie does an amazing job as both characters. And there's also a right, evenly amount, good balance, perfect balance, of action, humor, and a slight dark tone. The more action and humor, and if anything, you'll at least enjoy the action scenes, which are kind of a combination of live action and CGI, look pretty decent. The balance here was handled way better than they kind of did in Let There Be Carnage, which got way too goofy, specifically with Venom at the nightclub scene, and them being two, suddenly being two separate entities. That's kind of one of the reasons why I was disappointed to Let There Be Carnage when I first saw it, and it took me a second rewatch to finally appreciate this movie, but to be honest, I did not like this movie when I first saw it either, but... However, I realized the critics were kind of wrong when I saw this the second time around, and it's still not a masterpiece, but I think it's still enjoyably much better the second time around, and I saw what they kind of were trying to do. You actually, unlike Spider-Man 3, you actually care about Eddie here. It's not because they give some savvy backstory about loss or self-reflection, but you can actually relate to what happens to him, and how he may have reacted to the same scenario. He wasn't rich, a god or born with powers, didn't live a super advanced technology or volunteer to an experiment. It was just a guy who was a nine to five in a regular relationship and living in the same world where stakes, shakedowns, and homelessness exist, and a company just ruined his whole life and career. A greedy, corrupt executive who didn't want to take responsibility for his bad deeds. When Eddie tried to literally call him out on them, The critics like wanted a different movie than what they got. Like they just wanted some basic Marvel superhero movie without realizing one of the better super movies as of late, like such as Logan, for example, didn't follow that formula either, and somehow that got critical praise. It was still rated R, still had the gore of a certain Wolverine comic, but it wasn't a Marvel movie. Eddie Brock is definitely likable, relatable, like Tom Hardy, who who is alright as Bane, decently good as Bane, knocks it out of the park with his performance of the character. And you felt for Ed, and you and I actually felt for Eddie here and was drawn to his plight. Some have complained the beginning of the movie is too slow, like Eddie Brock kept my interest the whole time. And everything about Venom in this movie is super cool. The struggle between Eddie and Venom and their argument of better banter made for both of them to lifelong conflict and laugh out loud comedy. And there were a few lines that were duds and made me roll my eyes, but I thought it was fantastic. And the mix of action, horror, and comedy was done perfectly balanced well, in my opinion. This was a concern of mine, like based I was like also a bit concerned based off the negative reviews. But I felt the filmmakers pulled it off well. And everybody keeps saying, this script is a mess. I didn't think it was. It shows Eddie's life, to turning to Venom, and then working together. It's a solid story, and one I like to watch again. The actors were brilliant, and I can't fault any of that. It's fun, thrilling, exciting, and has the rich amount of humor in it. And we saw Venom like we've never seen on the big screen in this movie. It was different, but I thought it was good. As a faithful Marvel product... The movie contains underlying themes of overcoming humanity for the best of all, and the fall into self-righteousness and the last proclamation of divinity. And this, like, remember the psychedelic dialogue between Drake, God, and Isaac, a poor soul that has nothing to lose, and despite the cliched parts, the original point is about the concept of loser or winner. Brock is not an obvious loser who plays dirty to defeat an obvious winner, Drake, and Drake is the real actual winner, and here comes the message. Like, nowadays, being a winner just means being influenced with all the themes about disruption of society, 
environmental, egotistical, irrational, let me tell yours, and also with the good ones of curiosity, under, understanding, imagination. Obviously, though, to become the real boss, you have to fall into ambition, self proclamation, ruthlessness, and lust for power. So much that only losers come from another planet that can do something about it. Nice, but here are the weaknesses come. Like, why Venom changed his mind? It can't be that simple. Just because it's just because it's a loser like Brock, is it redemption? Is it opportunity? Is it another kind of ruthlessness? The movie does not develop its best part, and that's why it's kind of just an action movie, not a perfect one. But I like that. I like it's not another typical generic Marvel film that's just trying to rip off the MCU, or just trying to cash in on Deadpool, or anything like that. Like, I like this one just feels a little more different, and I like to see Sony and Marvel try to do something a little bit different here, and just retry the same exact MCU stuff, just try to copy the MCU, like Warner Bros. forced the Snyderverse to do, and keep failing, regardless. Maybe get good with critics, but not so great with audiences. Here, you did not do great with critics, but some audiences seem to like you better. Here. This movie seems like it actually tried to do something a little different for a change. And actually kind of, kind of like trying to be like the 2000s Marvel films that I think are underrated. And I do like how it ends. Like during the finale, the four symbiote riots makes its way from Malaysia to San Francisco by hopping from body to body, and it bonds with Drake, who agrees to take Ryan a Life Foundation space probe to collect the rest of the symbiotes and bring him to Earth. And why reluctantly bonds with Venom? So they can free Brock. And when Brock and pretty much we get a brief cameo of She Venom. Of She Venom here. So it's nice. We got to see a little bit of She Venom in this movie for at least a brief scene. We even see her for a brief scene again in the sequel. And they and then the, the Venom symbiote bonds with Brock again. So when Brock and Venom are bonded again, the latter promises that has been convinced to help protect Earth from his kind throughout its interactions with Brock, and the pair attempt to stop Ryan and Drake with Ryan's help. Venom damages the probe as it takes off and causing it to explode and kill both Ryan and Drake. And after the incident, Brock returns to journalism and, and has basically gets his job back. Here, finally able to expose the truth about Drake's company. He can finally come back. I'm back to journalism now, after everything's been exposed. And uh, Drake is now killed. And Wine believes Brock is no longer bond to Venom, but it turns out, and we think Venom died in the explosion, but apparently the pair remains secretly bonded. And so it's been, like, there's a thing though. I wanted to know, did Venom really die? Did Venom really, be, was Venom really on the ship? We never know what happened and how they're secretly bonded. Like, I wanted to know a little bit more about that. Like, we could have found out a little more about that, but it kind of just randomly happens. And they set out to protect San Francisco by killing criminals. And right here, guys, Eddie often visits the shop owned by Miss Chen. And um, this mugger guy keeps coming in to rob her. But then Venom appears and kills that mugger guy. And like that beginning cutscene, we get that iconic scene here. And of course, he's like, oh, why have a parasite? I miss his gem, and, and they pretty much, and Venom's like, we can do whatever we want. And the credits roll, but then during the mid-credits scene, Stinner, Brock then gets invited to interview and comparisonated serial killer Cletus Cassidy, who promises carnage when he escapes. Because he's like, when I get out, and I will, there's going to be carnage. Which teases the sequel, Let There Be Carnage, that I was excited for as I was like, whoa, and they're actually, no way, they're actually going to put a nasty or Marvel character as the villain in the sequel. No way. They're actually going to put Carnage in a movie. And I never thought they'd ever have the balls to do that. We saw how it went. They still didn't make a rated R. I mean... I didn't think Let There Be Carnage was terrible, but it's a tad bit weaker than the first. I don't think I didn't think it was better than the first film. Which brings to the next point. Yes, I do agree the movie has some bad qualities. So here we go. First off, the runtime. It kind of feels a bit short, not as short as the sequel was, but even that could have this could have been longer too. And second, the film kind of portrays Eddie and Venom as two separate people which not, is not really what they are. They're not really separate from each other. 
They're kind of meant to be one, like in the Spider-Man comics, while still saying we and stuff, and they're kind of meant to be one bonded whole personality. They're not two separate personalities. So I can agree with that criticism. And um, and now Michelle Williams' character, Anne Wayne. Anne Wayne. I forget how her last name is pronounced, but okay, just Anne. I am not a fan of Anne in the, any of these films. She doesn't feel useful to any of the plots. She's just too snotty to really sympathize with and care for. And then, like, like Eddie's interview also gets Anne fired. She's furious with him, but then suddenly, when she finds out he's bonded with a symbiote, she suddenly wants him to go to the hospital after finding out about a symbiote incident quick. I don't really buy that. At all. I just don't. Sorry, guys, but just don't really like Anne in these movies. If they even bring her back in the third one, they better actually make her useful. And, of course, finally, the villain Riot, Drake, just kind of feels lousy to me. Because he just doesn't do a lot until the end. People can say what they want about Woody, well, Woody Harrelson's carnage, but... Woody Harrelson's Carnage may be a little miscasted, but Carnage, at least, we knew was a threat from start to finish. He felt better performed. His film should have still been rated R. Speaking of that part, I also don't like they made the movie PG-13 instead of R. Well, yeah, sure, the movie... I mean, yeah, this movie actually is surprisingly pretty violent for a PG-13 movie, and having no gore. But we still should have had, this movie still should have been rated R anyways. Because Venom, Riot, Carnage are all rated R characters, so these movies need to be rated R. Here. And I don't care if you want more money from China or anything like that, but doesn't matter if you wanted a billion dollars or not. Venom is not a PG-13 character. He still should have been rated R regardless of the outcome or not. Especially Carnage the most. Like, I don't know why, like, I really wish we could have had an unrated PG-13 cut for both these movies. Like, we had director's cuts for Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, Suicide Squad 2016, why couldn't we have had one for the Venom movies? A separate version that people could have preferred if they didn't like the PG-13 versions, then they could have just skipped the PG-13 versions and just watched the unrated ones as the true versions. I feel like that would have been better. There was a rumor, though, that maybe, just maybe, Venom 3 could be rated R. Yeah, that stupid Craven the Hunter movie is going to be rated R, but there was also a rumor Venom 3 could be. So, I hope they do that. They need to do that. It's like, they need to step up their game with this third one. And they need to kind of get as far away from the hammy, goof, wacky, out-of-nowhere tone of Let There Be Carnage that turned me off. But So I hope Venom 3 could be R-rated and try to be more like the first film and not like whatever the sequel was. No. And have a longer runtime, please. But I don't let those ruin the movie for me. And I still have a lot of fun with it. In the end... Venom may not be for everyone, but I think it's a watch and buy for fans of Venom and those who want to see a fun popcorn Marvel movie that's not supposed to be taken seriously here, and a better portrayal of the character after Tover Grace's awful version. Anyway, that's it for my review of Venom. I'm wondering how I'm going to rate Venom. Here's how I'm going to rate this movie. So overall, if you want a better version of Brock and Venom after Spider-Man 3, then I do recommend watching and buying this movie for your collection for sure, if you are a fan of this stuff. And if you are wondering how I'm going to rate Venom, I'm going to give Venom a 7.5 out of 10. There we go. Now wraps up my review for Venom. And um before I end this review, guys, um there's gonna be a bit of changes, so I think like well it's concerning my little Disney criticisms and um I'm still gonna criticize the new stuff any new dumb ideas Disney does today. Those are never going to go, right? But when I do criticize Disney, I'm going to say 
modern Disney with these ones next time. So that people know I'm talking about the new Disney today. And no, I'm not racist because I don't want to see the Little Mermaid remake. I have every right to not be excited for the Little Mermaid remake. Every right. For good reason. Okay? Because it looks like a cash grab and I'm tired of the remakes. Not racist. <sighs> Whatever, like, but, but yeah. That'll be it for this review. There's your changes. Like, from now on, when I criticize Bash Disney, I'm just going to say Modern Disney. So people know what I'm talking about. Until then, guys, that'll be it for this review. Thank y'all for watching. If you like this want to see more, and don't forget to like, subscribe to Donji Corleone.